Hello people, in this video we, are, we want to look at cerebral palsy. This is a topic we are looking at under pediatrics. You will also look at the same topic under orthopedics uh, uh, for orthopedics type of fixes. So look at this, uh, what is cerebral palsy? It's permanent, it's non-progressive, occasionally evolving though. Disorders of tone, movement and posture caused by an insult to the developing brain. So this is what you have to focus here, to a developing brain. What type of brain? Can can it happen to your brain and my brain if there's an insult? Will it cause cerebral palsy? No, here they are talking about a developing brain. This is a pediatrics topic, remember. So basically, let's delete this image and put this image. So basically, it is to the developing brain that the insult is happening, right? So what will happen to, because of this insult to the developing brain? So let us say some part of it, this part of it is having some insult. So what will happen there will be, it's permanent, this damage is permanent, okay, to the brain. And whatever disorder happens because of this damage, um, those can be disorders of tone, movement and posture. So this, whatever insult has happened, has happened, it's not going to progress, okay, this insult is going to be this much only. Okay, so this uh, uh, insult will not progress. However, there can be disorders of tone, movement and posture. Unfortunately, this is the most common chronic motor disability. Okay, guys. So, this is most common chronic motor disability. And uh, which is the most common cause? They are saying it is the perinatal asphyxia. That is birth asphyxia. That is uh, uh, just before uh, or during or just after the labor. So, let's say this is labor. The mother is pushing the baby out of the vagina. So, just before this, right just before this or during labor or just post this okay so all this is called as perinatal the most common cause of cerebral palsy is asphyxia during this labor okay so this is what is the most common cause but otherwise there are a lot of other causes okay let's look at all the causes as to why the brain has an injury insult insult it's not an injury it's an insult so choose your words uh, carefully guys uh, for the definition he, there is an insult to the brain what is there to the brain it's insulted brain is insulted okay it is not injury it is insult this is a permanent non-progressive right e occasionally evolving it's a disorder of tone movement and posture what and all of tone movement and posture okay uh, disorder of tone movement and posture and um, it is caused, why? Because of an insult to the developing brain. This is also something that you have to write, okay? Now, let us look at um, the other definition from the textbook, CP. If they say CP, uh, if they have given you a CP case, that means it is cerebral palsy case. Again here, it's a chronic motor disability which is non-progressive. It is not fatal, but not curable. It, it happens because of damage to the growing brain before birth, during birth or after birth. That's what they told you, perinatal. So basically, this is a definition from yet another textbook where they are saying the same thing, okay, same language only they are using. But look at this here. What the, uh, the other textbook says is that earlier you thought that it was birth asphyxia which causes it, but now they are saying it is some unknown etiology which causes the uh, cerebral palsy, okay. So it is non-fatal is a nice thing. Let's make it green, then yet not curable. That means you can only manage whatever uh, is happening symptoms wise. You cannot go and fix the insult to the brain. You cannot fix the insult to the brain, right? So, growing brain is an important word here. It's a chronic motor disability. What type of disability? Motor. They are saying, they are specifically using the more word motor. Here also they use the word motor, right? Motor disability. It is a motor disability. Let's use a specific color for that. It's a motor disability. Okay. Now let us look at the causes, guys, of uh, cerebral palsy. This is very easy, guys. Prenatal, perinatal, postnatal. I would say this is natal. Prenatal, natal, postnatal. Together, all this only becomes perinatal, right? But anyways. Um, prenatal, that is before the uh, labor, right? Genetic, it could be genetic. The baby was born with some structural malformation of the nervous system. So it can happen that the baby was congenital or uh, there is some structural malformation of the nervous system. It was malformed. 
malformed. It was malformed, that word. Congenital or intrauterine infection. So, some infection led to when it was in the mother's womb. That time itself, some infection has caused some insult to the brain. What is the word that you are using here? Insult. Insult. Who caused the insult? Infection caused the insult. Okay, then. Maternal obstetric complication. Some complication in the mother. Some obstetric complication. Teratogens. What are teratogens? You know, so many types of teratogens are there. Rubella. Diabetes itself uh, of the mother it can be a teratogen. So many drugs can be teratogens. So many chemicals, radiations can be teratogens. All those things can cause what? Insult to the brain. Cerebral palsy. Very good. Now, let's come to the next part. Natal. So, birth asphyxia. Can you not write this? If you don't write this, that's very, very bad. Because they suspect that this is one of the major causes, isn't it? One textbook says this is the major cause, actually. The other textbook says that it can be mostly unknown etiology. But anyways, we'll go with the known one, birth asphyxia. Why does birth asphyxia happen, guys? Prolonged labor, umbilical cord prolapse, I'm thinking. What else can you think of? Asphyxia. Uh, birth asphyxia causes, do you know? So basically, the placenta is supposed to supply oxygen and it has, it is not supplying, right? So it could be uh, uh, early separation from the placenta, right? What else? Imagine if the umbilical cord is compressed for whatever reason, right? Then also there, there may not be enough oxygen supply to the baby from the placenta. There can be meconium aspiration. Imagine if this baby um, has uh, uh, breathed in meconium. What will happen? It will go and be sitting in the lungs, right? So the baby inhales a mixture of the amniotic fluid and meconium. That's the first species. So there can be birth asphyxia. It cannot get enough oxygen, right? So, there will be asphyxia, hypoxia. Premature birth, this baby is born uh, much before uh, its uh, term, right? So, premature, if it is born before 37 weeks, the lungs may not be fully developed. If the lung is not developed of the baby, what will happen? It will not be able to take in oxygen, etc. So, again, there is asphyxia, hypoxia, all that you can remember. Uh, what is the difference between hypoxia and asphyxia? What do you think? So, guys, it is very interesting. Hypoxia is low oxygen, okay? Hypoxia, obviously, hypoxia, hypoxia, low oxygen. This will result in suffocation, etc. That will be asphyxia, okay. So, hypoxia will lead to asphyxia. So, now you have understood the difference between these two terms, okay. Hypoxia leads to asphyxia, okay. What else, guys? Amniotic fluid embolism, uterine rupture, the placenta separates from the uterus, infection, prolonged labor, difficult labor, blood pressure in pregnancy, high or low, anemia, right? Uh, the blood cells are not carrying enough oxygen, etc. So, all these can result in birth asphyxia. Then, coming to the next uh, uh, things, we are moving on after birth asphyxia, guys. Prematurity, low birth weight. So, prematurity, low birth weight itself... Uh, we are not talking about hypoxia, asphyxia. This itself can lead to insult to the brain. Okay. So, <clears throat> prematurity, low birth weight, birth trauma, intracranial hemorrhage. So, there is some intracranial hemorrhage, birth trauma. Uh, I am thinking this birth trauma can be because of what? <clears throat> can it be because of instruments or something? Intracranial hemorrhage, etc. Hyperbilirubinemia. That is jaundice, that is uh, what do you say, bilirubin levels are more, bilirubin levels are more. So why does bilirubin level become more guys? It can happen because of uh, usually of, uh, uh, pathological jaundice you say, okay. So there are a lot of types of hyperbilirubinemia, you have unconjugated, conjugated, so many varieties, early onset hyperbilirubinemia, late onset uh, hyperbilirubinemia, because of RH uh, iso, um, isoimmunization, that is mother being uh, negative and the baby being RH positive or there can be some minor blood group incompatibilities, there can be G6PD deficiency. Right, uh, spirocytosis, uh, hemoglobinopathies, basically the hemolysis will happen, right, leading to hyperbilirubinemia. Or it can happen, uh, uh, you know, late onset or the first week of life where you can have, there can be sepsis, right, there can be, um, what else, metabolic disorders like galactosemia, storage disorders, there can be cephalohematoma, right, 
what else guys do you know of uh, causes of hyperbilirubinemia itself are so many right um, breast milk jaundice can be there some gastrointestinal tract abnormality sepsis cystic fibrosis hypothyroidism that is cretinism all that right can uh, present as uh, bili hyperbilirubinemia hypoglycemia see this is very very important the brain needs glucose so if the baby has not been fed right or if it is born to a diabetic mother it has a very healthy pancreas making lot of insulin it can go into hypoglycemia so hypoglycemia is the one if there is less glucose what will happen brain will suffer an insult okay so all this you should know central nervous system infection infection you can write everywhere so here also they have written infection here also you can write infection right uh, central nervous system infection can be what meningitis encephalitis etc is it so don't forget hypoglycemia very important it is because some babies would not have been fed uh, as soon as they are born right they can go into hypoglycemia that's why you should not wait for the baby to cry you should breastfeed immediately or at least give some kind of a feed for the baby right uh, a formula feed or uh, not i'm not suggesting it but in case the mother has not been able to come out of the cesarean etc uh make sure that the baby doesn't go into hypoglycemia okay the uh, what were is we're saying hyperbilirubinemia intracranial hemorrhage okay birth trauma okay all this we saw that is during uh, during the labor okay now let's move on postnatal postnatal again they are saying infection hypoxia can lead to asphyxia same thing trauma toxins uh, what toxins can be there after uh, birth we need to check this list a little more trauma why did the baby have trauma after uh, birth okay check all that okay now let us go to the clinical features of uh, clinical features of cp see actually cp children have a varied presentation okay no don't go by this photo here because cp children are actually very joyful and nice it is just varying in person to person as to how much of insult has happened in which part of the brain okay so guys there they will have developmental delay okay developmental delay can be a gross motor delay or a fine motor delay or a social uh, skill delay or a language delay also there so many delays are there right but um, they are talking about uh, motor because they said it's a chronic motor disorder isn't it so let us look at this there will be reflexes which are in uh, which are but still persistent like primitive reflexes like what pamar uh, grasp reflex right grasp reflex or uh, morose reflexes also i'm thinking uh, it should go away right so such uh, primitive reflexes will still remain okay there will be persistence of these uh, reflexes and there will be increased tone how do you define tone guys muscle tone how do you define muscle tone basically it is uh, when a muscle is relaxed the tension in it is the uh, tone right so there's increased tone so even at rest the muscle will be very tensed okay fisting with cortical thumb so how will the fist be when they make a fist they'll use be using cortical thumb what do you mean by cortical thumb what do you mean by that so when they make a fist guys um, this is something that uh, babies have that they will keep the thumb inside but this should this should not continue if it continues it is a clinical feature of cerebral palsy this is how they have explained cortical thumb okay thumb just look at the cortical thumb but here they are not talking about cortical thumb they are saying fisting with cortical thumb not just cortical thumb fisting with cortical thumb scissoring of scissoring of leg look at this how they are scissoring the legs like actually you can see scissoring right how do you explain a scissoring gait the knees and the thighs pressed together or crossing each other while walking so this is because of high muscle tone spasticity okay then scissoring of leg very important you should write this cortical thumb very important you should write this then toe walking see they do toe walking In this they have shown toe walking look at this toe walking see how they are using toes to walk toe walking right and here they have shown the scissoring gait kind of a thing abnormal posture and gait yeah what is the gait scissoring gait right abnormal movements hyperreflexia hyperreflexia okay then 
let's go here to the next part common comorbidity so apart from the uh, gait and etc right uh, look at the comorbidities there will be intellectual disability so intellectually also there is some problem not just with your motor stuff intellectual problem is there microcephaly can be the small brain is it seizures these people can suffer from seizures behavioral problems difficulty in speech language swallowing or feeding blindness deafness squint malnutrition sleep disturbance and excessive drooling excessive drooling contractures may develop that are initially dynamic and later fixed fixed means it's not repaired it is fixed the contracture is fixed okay initially it's a dynamic and later fixed so in this photo they have shown some contracture etc let's look at this <clears throat> so hypertonia contractures and that's how they are saying contracture contracture so initially the contractures may develop that are dynamic and later fixed okay so these are the clinical features of cerebral palsy very very important each word seems to be important here guys can you say these words say that uh, physical findings will be neonatal reflexes will be persisting there will be increased tone tone will be more increased tone fisting with cortical thumb shown here cortical thumb shown here actually not the fisting scissoring of legs toe walking abdominal posture and gait abdominal movements hyperreflexia <coughs> increased tone hyperreflexia what are the other things that will be there in these people intellectual disability microcephaly seizures behavioral problems difficulty in language speech swallowing or feeding there can be drooling that they have written here so feeding swallowing you can go with that together at the same time you can say this then blindness blindness deafness squint so let's put blindness and squint here deafness malnutrition because they are not able to swallow or feed then we'll put it here malnutrition sleep disturbances contractures which are initially dynamic and later fixed okay now let us move from the clinical features let's check the classification of cerebral palsy guys very important okay guys time for classification so basically there are many types of classification topographically you can classify as quadriplegic hemiplegic monoplegic diplegic what is quadriplegic all four limbs affected equally hemiplegic one side of the body affected monoplegic looks like one limb what is diplegic the bottom half of the body right so this is topographic classification of cerebral palsy physiological classification you need to know a lot of physiology to understand this spastic dyskinetic ataxic mixed so will you be able to say this spastic where there's spasm spasm muscle spasm dyskinetic involuntary movements abnormal right ataxic lack of coordination mixed okay now when it comes to spastic this can be quadriplegic diplegic or hemiplegic okay so you should remember so again spastic palsy can be quadriplegic diplegic or hemiplegic while the dyskinetic palsy may be chorioathetoid or dystonic see chorioathetoid means there's some twitching of the muscle or something what is dystonic movement disorder of the muscles okay so again there can be involuntary contraction repetitive movements twisting movements okay dystonic so did you understand this so a classification of cerebral palsy topographically you have this one that is uh, quadriplegic hemiplegic uh, monoplegic diplegic physiologically spastic dyskinetic ataxic mixed okay now let us go into some details of the spastic one okay then we'll go to the dyskinetic one how's it going people so now shall we continue with the spastic one in detail so there can be spastic spastic quadriplegia that is all four limbs affected right 
So the spastic means there will be muscle spasm. So you can see something like this. All four limbs affected. This is the most common type of cerebral palsy in India. That is sad, right? So you have so many options of hemiplegia, diplegia, etc. But the one that is in common is actually something that's affecting all the four limbs. And what are the co uh, why does this happen? Same reasons you say, okay, birth asphyxia, men, uh, neonatal illness, infection, okay, comorbidity, same thing you will write, disability, intellectual disability, uh, seizure, pseudo bulbar palsy. What is pseudo bulbar palsy? Microcephaly, squint, visual disturbances, speech abnormalities, difficult uh, deformities. And when you do neuroimaging, what can you see in the cystic encephalomalacia? Cystic encephalomalacia. So some terminologies we have to crack here. What is pseudo bulbar palsy? So basically, a pseudo bulbar palsy is an upper motor neuron lesion of the cranial nerves nine, ten, and well is it so it is a syndrome of upper motor neuron paralysis that affects the cortico bulbar system above the brain stem okay so this is above the brain stem they are saying see bulbar palsy is they are saying is low motor neuron lesion okay but pseudo bulbar palsy is due to upper motor neuron lesion okay so it is uh, because of cortico bulbar tracts disturbance of cortico bulbar tracts so pseudo bulbar palsy, you now coming to this palsy, this arthria, this phagia, facial tongue weakness can be there. Okay. So pseudo bulbar, they are saying is more like upper motor neuron lesion or something. Okay. Microcephaly, small brain, squint, visual disturbances, speech abnormalities, deformities, then in the brain you can see cystic encephalomalacia. What do you actually mean by Malaysia in medical terms? What do you mean Malaysia? Softening, okay? Softening is called as Malaysia. Osteomalacia. Rickets, you will see that, right? So Malaysia means actually softening. Okay, guys, so we are trying to crack every word of the textbook. Now we have finished spastic quadriplegia. Now let's go to spastic diplegia. Dip means like this one. This is diplegia, right? Both the lower limbs affected. This is diplegia. So spastic diplegia is the second most common type and is linked to prematurity. For diplegia, they are mostly blaming prematurity. Uh, otherwise, uh, for quadriplegia, they blamed asphyxia, neonatal illness. But prematurity, they are saying, will uh, lead to this uh, diplegia. The intellect is often preserved. You can see that because uh, the upper part is kind of fine, isn't it? So the intellect is kind of preserved, they are saying, in diplegia. Neuroimaging in these people, you will see periventricular leukomalacia, I am guessing. Wait, let's correct this. Leukomalacia. So you have now looked at spastic diplegia. Correct, guys? So leukomalacia, what will be there? Periventricular leukomalacia, around the ventricles, is it? Periventricular leuco, white, white, is it? Malacia softening. Now let's go to the third one guys, the one that we left is the hemiplegia, so spastic hemiplegic palsy, okay. So uh, what will happen in this spastic hemiplegic means one side of the body is affected, right. So it usually results from vascular insult or perinatal stroke, so vascular insult, stroke, stroke happens. Usually you would have seen stroke patients in your hospital, this is how they come, right, right side full, not uh, responding kind of a thing or a left side not working. Right, so is an avascular insult or a perinatal stroke. Okay, early hand preference is a clue. So you know whether they are preferring the right hand or the left hand. In these people, you will see that there is a focal change. Okay, or a what is this? Encephalitic cyst. Poor encephalitic cyst. So there is again some cyst here they are telling. These children are usually mobile, okay, because their lower limbs are not affected. You can see that at least one side is perfectly fine. In this guy, two, uh, two legs gone. In this guy, also two legs gone. But this, these people can, are usually mobile and um, they may have preserved or impaired intellect. So either way it can have. So look at this brain is like they are doubtful. So either they can be perfectly fine brain wise or they may not be. That they are not sure in hemiplegic, okay. So you have spastic, quadriplegic, diplegic and hemiplegic. Diplegic is the most uh, second most common, that's why they have put it here. Otherwise in the diagram, diplegic is the third one. 
and uh, most commonly it's linked to prematurity okay now we have to go to the dyskinetic type of cerebral palsy dyskinetic means what you saw what is the meaning of dyskinetic you saw already dyskinetic means abnormal involuntary movements right so here this is extra pyramidal palsy okay this is also called as extra pyramidal palsy this can also happen because of asphyxia or carnicteris carnicteris is not car hyperbilirubinemia right carnicteris how do you define this carnicteris it's nothing but brain damage due to high level of bilirubin okay so uh, extra pyramidal palsy dyskinetic so they have involuntary uh, abnormal involuntary movements so there will be rigidity see there is no they are not talking about spasticity here here they are talking about rigidity what do you mean by this uh, spasticity there is spasticity there is there, there is spasm here rigidity dystonia dyskinesia drooling are prominent okay intellectual uh, uh, intellect is relatively preserved this is a nice one right and uh, here you will see abnormalities in basal ganglia or thalamus so that is what is extra pyramidal palsy abnormalities in basal ganglia or thalamus okay so then you have some other palsies ataxic palsy and mixed ataxic is where you saw that there is coordination difficulty right so this is cerebella this is not pay attention here this is not something to do with your cerebrum this is something to do with your cerebellum that is why coordination balance kind of thing ataxic palsy guys cerebral malformation you know where the cerebellum is right or we have to show you that this is cerebrum what you are seeing here down what you see this is the cerebellum when that is affected you can have ataxic palsy okay and associated with other cerebellar signs all cerebellar 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 ataxic cerebellar wherever you will write you have already seen in medicine so much of ataxia and cerebellum linked mixed cp is referring to both spastic and extra pyramidal features that means it will have spastic um, that features what are those spastic features that you have seen there will be spasm seizures right specifically what do you say spasm what about extra pyramidal features you will see dystonia rigidity dyskinesia drooling okay now let's move to the last part guys evaluation and management so you will take a detailed history to know what has happened right uh, during birth etc then you will do a physical and neurological examination then what else spasticity is classified using tools such as gross motor functions and you have some uh, classification system and modified ashworth scale so there are a lot of classification guys no practical limitation of activities slight moderate limitation gross limitation inability to carry on any phys useful physical activity lot of types of classifications are there anyways now let us go on to the management so basically this is a uh, it's not just an individual doctor who can manage this you will need a pediatrician occupational therapist physiotherapist psychologist orthopedic surgeon speech therapist ophthalmologist ent specialist social worker social ed special educator almost all the departments that we know are getting involved here right because you know we told you sister gate etc orthopedic surgeons speech problems swallowing problem uh, visual disturbances right can be their blindness the uh, squint so ophthalmologist ent we told you there could be deafness then that you need a, um, a psychologist to help them right physiotherapist again if they want to have some muscles and all um, to work on some muscles etc right now let us come into uh, come to this how will you manage general spasticity guys we are looking at the management pay attention here uh physiotherapy you can do drugs you can give such as diazepam this is this is printed wrong hold on let's give the correct spelling how will you treat this is baclofen is it yeah it's correct only baclofen what is this tinazidine and dantrolene dantrolene is skeletal muscle relaxant what is baclofen baclofen have you heard of baclofen which category is it coming in pharmacology to treat pain and spasticity okay it is to treat treat pain and certain types of 
capacity. Okay. So, which category is it coming? It's a muscle relaxer. Okay. Muscle relaxant. Let's write this here. Muscle relaxant. Okay. To treat pain and spasticity. Then you have this one. Tina, Tina Zidine. Can you guess this Tina Zidine? Zidine, Zidine. Again, this is also muscle relaxant only, but short acting. Okay. Short acting muscle relaxer. Okay. Then dantrolene also muscle relaxant. So all muscle relaxants they are using. Okay. Localized spasticity. This is for generalized spasticity. Generalized spasticity. Now look at local spasticity. Just locally you will give botulinum toxin. And that will anyways relax the muscle locally, right? Then you can uh, you can also do tendon release, tendon lengthening as per the requirement. If there is dystonia, right, then you can manage it with trihexyphenidyl, again botulinum and, or levodopa. This trihexyphenidyl is actually anticholinergic, it seems. Have you heard of this? Let's open our pharmacology video and check. If you remember KD Tripathi classification of anti-muscarinic drugs, here down you can see here atropine and all it's saying, down here anti-parkinsonian this is a synthetic compound trihexyphenidyl benzhexol it is it's nothing but benzhexol so it is going to be anti-parkinsonian right what are we looking at as an anti-spasmodic is it interesting okay so that is the management of uh, cerebral palsy guys so you have learnt a lot in this video on cerebral palsy. There is still a lot, lot more. Let's take a recap. So basically, cerebral palsy, it is a group of disorders of the movement and the posture. There will be limitation of activity. However, this is non-progressive. Okay. And this has happened because of insult to the developing brain. It could be the fetal brain or the infant brain. Now, this is very common motor, chronic motor disability. And uh, what else here? The causes, prenatal malformations, infections, complications, teratogens. Natal can be birth asphyxia, prematurity, intracranial hemorrhage, birth trauma, hyperbilirubinemia, hypoglycemia. Central nervous system infection. Infection you write in all the three. Okay. Postnatal again infection. Hypoxia. Trauma. Toxins. Okay. Then clinical features you saw that uh, there can be developmental delay. Persistence of primitive reflexes. Increased tone. Fisting with cortical thumb. Right. Scissoring of the leg. Toe walking. Abnormal posture. Scissoring gait we told you. Hyper reflexia. See increased tone or hyper tone right hypertonia can you see that comorbidity so many are there like intellectual disability microcephaly seizures behavioral problems difficulty in speech language swallowing feeding malnutrition excessive drooling blindness squint deafness sleep disturbances contractures which may be initially dynamic and later fixed classification of uh, uh, cerebral palsy it can be topographically classified as quadriplegic hemiplegic or uh, um, diplegic shown here. Um, you can also have monoplegic. Physiologically, you can have it as spastic, that is muscle spasmosis, dyskinetic, abnormal involuntary movement, ataxic, like lack of coordination, mixed, etc. Again, spastic can be quadriplegic or uh, diplegic or hemiplegic, and uh, dyskinetic can be choreoathetoid or dystonic. Okay, so basically, look at this one. Spastic diplegia, the problem is in the periventricular area. Remember, PVL, periventricular leukomalacia, right? Uh, then, um, this is the image showing spastic diplegia. Then, coming to spastic quadriplegia, look at this, both the uh, upper and lower limbs are affected. In this one, there can be even intellectual uh, difficulty, right? Uh, so, basically, here in spastic quadriplegia, there will be multicystic encephalopathy, like we told you here, mul uh, cystic. Uh, Encephalomalacia, right? Multicystic encephalopathy, parasitical brain injury, okay? And in these people, what did you see? That they can have intellectual disability, seizures, etc. Okay? 
this uh, diplegic is basically because of prematurity quadriplegia is because of asphyxia neonatal illness this is the standard one anyways this asphyxia and all you will write now coming to spastic hemiplegia hemiplegia means which one one side of the body affected right so um here what will be the problem guys focus are you listening there can be a stroke wax vascular insult or a perinatal stroke so you can know which hand the child is always preferring so early hand preference you can check you can see that there will be a poor encephalic cyst okay and these children usually can be mobile and they can have preserved or impaired intellect either ways it can be okay so let's move on we saw the other types of um, cerebral palsy like dyskinetic or extra pyramidal Dys dyskinetic or extra pyramidal both are same right here what is affected the basal ganglia remember abnormalities in basal ganglia or the thalamus right this can be caused because of neonatal uh, where are we neonatal jaundice okay jaundice chronic tris remember this okay what is then coming to the other type hypotonic cerebellar palsy is because of sorry <laughs> yeah cerebral palsy is because of Hi, cerebellar lesion this is also called as what hypotonic is it hypotonic cp cerebellar lesion okay now coming to mixed where they'll have both spastic and extra pyramidal or the dyskinetic features now coming to evaluation you will take history and you will do the gross motor function classification etc then you will do physical and neurological examination how will you manage basically you have to remember these words physiotherapy vision and hearing you will take care vision and hearing then early stimulation structured play therapy all these are some uh, ways of making the baby fine what is it early stimulation and structured play therapy okay guys so um what other points you should know about cerebral palsy from a different textbooks we textbook we will tell you guys uh, just note here some points here that we are trying to tell you is the hyper reflexia will be there right the deep tendon reflexes are brisk ankle clonus may be positive okay plantars may be extensor what is this when you lift the child you know yeah, there may be visible adductor spasm okay we are talking about the spastic kind looks like they are saying in another textbook guys that when you lift the child there can be visible adductor spasm crossing of the legs scissoring right and as the child go, grows in age there can be spasticity and rigidity which becomes more pronounced right and there can be abnormal posture contracture of the hip heels elbow etc and uh, this can later uh, the spasticity can lead to pseudo bulbar palsy where there can be swallowing difficulty excessive drooling etc where did you see pseudo bulbar palsy here so if there is pseudo bulbar palsy there can be swallowing difficulty excessive drooling okay so that's it guys so which are the reflexes that can persist we already told you the primitive reflexes can be something like the grasp reflex morose reflex tonic neck okay a lot of other uh, reflexes so if it is still persisting you can suspect cerebral palsy guys let us look at the orthopedic treatment of cp also why is scissoring happening guys scissoring happening uh, is happening because there is spasm of the adductors the adductors are kind of spasm they are all, they are adducted so which are the adductors and the adductors are all these adductor brevis adductor longus adductor magnus same adductor adductor only really everything is see here adductor magnus longus brevis and the pectineus etc so what these are spasm they match and this is spasm what will happen it will be like this right the bone so it is there is spasm of the adductor so the bone will become like this right the adductors are spasm so what will happen there will be scissoring gait right so now how will you treat this so for controlling spasticity diazepam baclofen we already told you this phenol phenol nerve block neurectomy right neurectomy may be required to control se severe muscle spasm if it is there they want to do a neurectomy which is the nerve that is supplying here 
the nerve that is supplying all these adductors of hip or the thigh, whatever you say, this adductors are being supplied by the obturator nerve. So this obturator nerve, they are doing neurectomy, neurectomy. Actually, a lot of other nerves also supply the tibial nerve, femoral nerve, they are saying, but obturator neurectomy is important. Look at this. Obturator neurectomy is performed for the spasm of adductors of the thigh. See, let's make this green because though it is, they are cutting the muscle, uh, nerve, it is actually a um, treatment. Right? You can't say it is green, can't say it's red. They are actually cutting the nerve. Right? A lot of other success, uh, operative measures also may be res, uh, required. So basically you remember this one. Okay, obturator neurectomy for repairing the spasm of the abductors of hip. So which are nothing but the adductor longus, brevis, magnus, pectineus, etc. Other drugs you have already learned, diazepam, beclofen, phenyl nerve block and neurectomy. This is the treatment they are talking about. Okay? Nerve block. Nerve block also doesn't work, then only they are doing neurectomy. Diazepam, beclofen, all these uh, we already told you in uh, treatment, in uh, normal treatment itself. Here, if you remember, we have told you that. Where was that? Here. Diazepam, beclofen. Beclofen is muscle relaxant. Diazepam is what? It is also, I only remember it as a benzo. But what does it do? Diazepam. Anxiety treatment, that also I know. But here, is it a muscle relaxant? Let's check, wait. What is the effect on of it? It's a muscle relaxant. Okay. For muscle spasm, you can give this. That's it, guys. We have finished cerebral palsy under pediatrics and also orthopedics. We have finished it. Bye-bye.